Hey everybody, today we're going to be learning about how dictators in the 1930s threatened world peace. So here we go. The first thing we're going to learn about is how these dictators were actually part of a wider trend called nationalism that was gripping or taking over Europe and Asia. One of the things that you learn about in this lecture is that there were failures that came from the Treaty of Versailles in World War I and that peace settlement that caused a lot of these trends that we saw in the 1930s. One of those trends was that the Treaty of Versailles overall caused a lot of anger and resentment among Europeans, especially among Germans. Germany resented the blame for that war, the loss of its colonies after the war was over, and the new border territories that were established after the war and after the Treaty of Versailles. Russia resented the loss of the land that it used to create other nations, and so there were new democracies that were floundering or not doing so well under social and economic problems as well throughout Europe. But overall, the dictators uh, rose and they were driven by nationalism and that desire for this new territory. So a lot of them were out on the hunt. <clears throat> Joseph Stalin is the first of these dictators that we'll learn about, and he transformed the Soviet Union in several ways. Uh, in 1922, when Vladimir Lenin established the Soviet Union after their civil war in 1918, uh, Joseph Stalin took over by 1924. Now, he replaced private farms or privately owned uh, businesses with collectives or government-owned farms and businesses. Uh, this created the second largest industrial power in the world at that time. Uh, they were second only to the United States in industrial power. But the famine that resulted from this process killed millions of people, between 8 and 12 million people. Uh, the purges uh, also killed anybody who was in opposition to him, and it was actually 8 to 13 million people. The totalitarian government that was established throughout this time in the Soviet Union exerted control over almost every aspect of the people's lives. Here's Joseph Stalin. He lived from 1878 to 1953. We'll also learn here about the rise of fascism in Italy. And Italy, the leader was a man named Benito Mussolini. But uh, let's talk about some of the history of Italy here briefly. So unemployment inflation led to bitter strikes in Italy and middle and upper classes wanted stronger leaders. Some of these strikes were actually led by communists as well in Italy. Fascism was the new political belief or ideology that came up in that place, and it stressed nationalism and the needs of the state above the individual. This is why nationalism and fascism are slightly different. Uh, nationalism is that fervor or pride in one's nation, but fascism takes it a step ahead, whereas it stresses that your only priority should be the nation. Benito Mussolini, like I said, played on the fears of economic collapse that a lot of Italians had, and he brought a new brand of communism to the economy of Italy. Uh, he was supported by government, by officials in, in leadership, by uh, police, by the army. And in 1922, he was appointed head of the government, and that's when he established the completely totalitarian state in Italy. This is Benito Mussolini. He was alive from 1883 to 1945. The Nazis are the group that we're going to talk about next here, and they took over Germany under the leadership of Adolf Hitler. He was the leader of the Nationalist Socialist German Workers' Party, Nazi Party for short, and uh, he had published a uh, memoir, a biography, if you will, called Mein Kampf, in which he stressed the basic beliefs of his new brand of nationalism called Na Nazism. Uh, this one is based on kind of an extreme version of nationalism. And he wants to unite all of the German-speaking people in this new uh, ideology he has, this belief he has. And he wants to enforce these strict racial purification guidelines where no race mixing is allowed, for example, between Jewish people and German people. In 1932, there were 6 million people unemployed in Germany. And this was one of the strategies that Hitler took advantage of. The fact that people were so desperate and so many men actually that were working age joined Hitler's private army. 
The Nazis became the strongest political party in Germany, and Hitler became the chancellor after he dismantled the Democratic Republic of Germany, the Weimar Republic, and he established what he and his supporters called the Third Reich. This is Adolf Hitler. He was alive from 1889 to 1945. Another group that happened to gain control in this period of time in the 30s is the militarists. These are a group of people that gained control in Japan. By 1931, the nationalist military leaders seized a part of China called Manchuria. And the League of Nations, which was the association created after World War I, was very, very weak and struggled a lot to stop these actions from Japan. In fact, they couldn't stop Japan. They condemned the actions. They said that they were not good actions that Japan was taking, but Japan simply ignored them and they quit the League of Nations. The militarists took control of the Japanese government and they led in a campaign of aggression uh, against other nations, including China. At the same time, in Europe and Africa, there's more aggression happening. By 1933, Hitler had quit also the League of Nations, and Germany was out. And by 1935, he began a military buildup, and he sent troops into the Rhineland, which is this neighboring territory next to Germany. The League of Nations did nothing to stop him. And also in Italy, by 1935, the League of Nations failed to stop Benito Mussolini's invasion of Ethiopia. These actions are all forms of aggression that these, these nations are taking against others. These are the Japanese militarists who took over the government of Japan before World War II. Civil war broke out in Spain, and in 1936, a general named Francisco Franco rebelled against the Spanish Republic. The Spanish Civil War began there, and, and Hitler and Benito Mussolini backed Francisco Franco. They supported him, while Stalin supported the op opposition there. The Western democracies of the world remained neutral. They tried to stay out of the conflict. But the war led to the Rome-Berlin Axis, which was the alliance between Italy and Germany during World War II. In 1939, Francisco Franco won the war, and he became the fascist dictator of Italy. This is Francisco Franco, who was alive between 1892 and 1975. So in this part of the lecture, we're going to learn about how the United States responded cautiously to these actions taken by these dictators in Europe and in Asia. The American public was clinging a lot to this idea of isolationism, the idea that we should stay out of the war. The public is still outraged from the outcomes of World War I, including the profits that banks were making because of the war and that arms dealers had made because of the exchange of weapons with countries like Great Britain during World War I. So a lot of Americans had become isolationists, and this led them to believe that the country is better off staying out of a conflict like the one we had during World War I. So Franklin Delano Roosevelt, FDR, backed away from any kind of foreign policy that could involve us in uh, the Second World War. In 1935, in fact, he and the Congress approved the Neutrality Acts, which were laws designed to try and keep the U.S. out of any future wars so we won't get dragged in there again. Outlaws that were against this law uh, were still selling arms to uh, nations that were at war, as well as providing loans to nations that were at war, including Great Britain. Neutrality finally broke down, and in 1937, Japan launched a new attack on China. Uh, this is when FDR, the president, and the Congress decided to send aid, money, and resources to China. FDR wanted to isolate the aggress aggressor nations in order to stop the U.S. from having to get involved. This is FDR here as he's given a speech to Congress trying to keep the U.S. out of World War II. It was very important for him and for the Democrats to promise to Americans that the United States would not fight in this war. In fact, the president, in my opinion, in a very irresponsible way, told mothers and fathers in the country that their children would not be sent to fight in another world war, knowing that there's the possibility that the United States could enter the war at any time. Finally, for conclusions to this lecture, 
During the 30s, several dictators rose to power in Europe and Asia. These leaders gained support through questionable strategies, such as Stalin's five-year plans, that in many cases cost many, many lives. Despite these horrible realities, however, the United States government attempted to keep the United States neutral. I hope you learned something new today. Thanks.